Hello YouTubers and uh, welcome to another video in my series of DIY Synthesizer Basics Tutorial. Now, everything I'm going to sort of kind of go through you are just tips and uh, sort of little things that have kind of helped me along the way. You're not saying this is definitely the way, the way you must do it, otherwise you would completely fail. No. Um, just going to sort of t let you know what's kind of helped me along the way, made things easier for me and how I've kind of learnt stuff pretty much from not knowing any, anything. I mean, I've only kind of got into this since around about March last year. My first uh, thing I had to go at was trying to build a Jupiter 8 uh, clone VCO, which I got from a site called muffwiggler.com, which is very handy to sort of uh, uh, be a member of, because they can answer lots of tips and questions for you. Um, also, there's a DIY Facebook, um, DIY Synthesizer Facebook group as well, which I am a part of, which is very handy. You can ask questions, and I can guarantee lots of things and things that you know niggles and um, problems you could probably get solved. Somebody will probably will have an answer or give you a pointer for. I just kind of wanted to uh, just share with you little bits and pieces and things that I've used in my project. Um, I'm pretty much trying to have to, have to do this on the budget, uh, etc. So, not having a proper oscilloscope for a start, which can cost a couple of hundred quid for a decent one, you can kind of get yourself this program here, which is a Windows oscilloscope program. And basically what that would do, it will use your um, audio interface as its input and display the output signal via that. So, if we go here to... Google and we type in Windows Oscilloscope and click on this one here. You can see that name, Christian, can't pronounce the last name. And here we have a free download of this program. And you can see Scope 1.46. If you're using XP, you might want to go for the 1.46 version because I believe there's a 1.8 version, which is a little bit buggy. But the, the advantage of the 1.8 version is that you can stretch the screen to be quite um, a full screen a full screen version and and what I have is this which is my audio interface as you can see it's a USB focus right interface you can get any any interface to be honest with you so we hooked this up via USB to our computer and what I made up was a couple let's see, let's see, let's see, out here is a couple of leads now if you look here this is sort of standard RCA leads and I stripped it down so we've got the earth the earth going into one side one connector blocked to another cable and the, the left and the right or the positive and negative going into one so we're just having a mono signal regardless of um, our inputs and what we want to try and do is test for our continuity now the outer sheathing is always the earth side and the inner part is going to be our, our positive hot side, etc. So we can just do a continuity test from one side and make sure we've got, when we, when we hook this up, we've made sure we've got continuity going throughout. So we can take these RCA jacks, plug it into the front, and then we can take that into the front of our audio interface, like so. Um, just bear with me a second. Now, what we have here, down here, is um, just lots and lots of different types of components and capacitors, switches, and potentiometers. It's best to kind of, if you're looking to build a circuit, go for off, try and get a, your hands on a variety of um, bits and pieces. I mean. I have bits here which I've kind of salvaged from a old Pioneer stereo um, cassette deck which was actually built in the 1970s. I really like these um, these trimmers, potentiometer trimmers, because when you mount them on the breadboard, on your breadboard, so I've used in my product, you can easily tweak these without a screwdriver or a mini screwdriver. Um, capacitors as well, I mean some of these, these are now pretty much obsolete but lots of people who do things like guitar pedals say they're quite very good tone capacitors some might say don't like them but things like these from old old non-working 
stereos and things I've kind of opened up and had a look at and things like this these capacitors here which are very very I found them very good on my when I first built my oscillators um, these are polystyrene sorry no not polystyrene polyester capacitors film polyester metal film capacitors uh, also very good when I for when I first built my Steiner Parker VCF they got, gave a very nice tone but I've kind of bettered that now with different components um, let's have a look I, mean, I've, I managed to get bits and pieces of, of, of diff, diff, sort of a variety of different sources there's also if you're in the UK there's Maplins and there's RS components and there's a few other guys about and also have a look on eBay if you look here I've got a bag of loads of um, poly styrene, these are the polystyrene capacitors are very good because they don't change their capacitance with heat but if you desolder these from anywhere they can change their capacitance so just be warned as far as that is concerned um, also get yourself some indicator tape as well so you can kind of label stuff and don't remember if you're beginning and you don't have a bipolar power supply the 9 volt battery trick where we have um, I think this is the positive we have a positive output cable, a negative output cable, which will give us minus nine volts, plus nine volts. We join these two ends together with a end connector like so, and then our output, we will have our zero volts or our ground. If we look on a schematic, we will see ground or zero volts symbol. And again, like I said, this variety of capacitors here and resistors as well. Just make sure you get as, as many hands on as many as you can, really. Um, transistors. NPN sort of general purpose 3N 2N should I say we had like the 2N 2N 3904 which is an NPN general purpose very common or the 2N 3906 which is the PNP now the thing about these um, particular transistors is that they come in a case which is known as I think it is the TN uh, TO-92 we call it a TO-92 case which is a plastic sort of case you see on these type of um, transistors we always have a they pretty much follow the same emitter base and collector which is really really handy and good but doesn't always it's not always the case. I mean, say for instance, we're looking at a transistor like, say, the BC547. Our pinouts could be completely different. So we've got collector, base, emitter. General rule of well, I say general rule of thumb. Most most modern transistors will have the the middle pin as the base. Out from that, um, here I have a very sort of cheap electronics tester, and we want to make sure we have. Um, good kind of uh, resistance range this goes uh, this goes up to 2000k which I think is 2 mega ohms if I be correct you might want to get one which is a higher range just in case you have a circuit which requires a higher than a 2 mega range uh, 2 mega ohm resistor and you want to make sure precisely that it is over a 2 mega ohm again there's also, if you go to the Google Play Store, there's an app. If you have an Android phone, I'm not sure if it works with the um, iPhones. You can get a color code, a resistor color code um, app, where you basically you it will ask you how many bands you have. You type in, you put in the color for each band, going from left to right, and it will give you a color code. Um, general rule with resistors is the last band. If it's gold, that will be the last band, which which denotes the tolerance. So on the gold band, they are normally about 5%, well, sorry, not the tolerance, the accuracy. Gold band will be about 5% accurate, and the brown will be 1%, which are normally the blue, sort of kind of blue, blue color resistors, carbon resistors. And like I said, if you just, you know, pick up old parts, I broke this out from an old stereo, just to try and find some sort of obsolete and some sort of, you know, parts that you may not find today and you could kind of surprise yourself what you, what you could do and save yourself a little bit of mishmash aka money with that one uh, basic tools pretty much you know cutters a pair of, a pair of wire cutters strippers 
um, on my project I use the breadboard so normally with breadboards when you buy breadboards people sort of supply a jumper cable that goes with that and I kind of thought to myself well the amount of jumper cable you get and the, the length they're kind of cut to length you can't really do nothing about them without destroying them I don't think they have a good value for money so go get yourself something like this which is a cat 6 cable comes with an outer sheath cat 6 or cat 5 cable you can buy I bought three meters of this which cost me under five UK pounds and when we strip it out we end up with we can end up with we end up with getting the actual solid we want solid strands just please note that solid strand to actually pin into your into your breadboard or even if you wanted to uh, solder that are probably uh yeah um so yeah so we can go into our, our breadboard with that and we can cut our wires to length exactly as we need them as well another little uh, tip if you're starting out and you're very sort of unfamiliar with how ICs integrated circuits and other components are get yourself some printouts and do yourself a little cheat sheet I got this one here when I started just to sort of um, so I knew um, what was what as far as transistors were concerned let me turn it around so when I had a transistor I sort of could go right okay that's what I'm dealing with that's my pin out for my transistors and also for integrated circuits as well you can you can find stuff on the internet like this list here which is basically a list of all the different if we look at the IC the, the numbers you sometimes have a a two uh, letter code so for instance um, TC which I think was Toshiba was the old Toshiba code um, well, that will be the manufacturer's kind of identifier code, and then we have the general sort of the general purpose number of that code as we look here. Um, and yeah, pretty much just lo lots and lots of different schematics here from different synthesizers and sort of uh, DIY projects, some less well known stuff. We've got a Cork MS20 schematic. I mean, if we go through schematics, we can pretty much find here we've got an SEM. The uh, SEM schematic here. Uh, I'm not sure. I think this is from the Korg Monotron. Again, here is another kind of um, cheat sheet, which gives us lots and lots of different diagrams and pinouts for the various integrated circuit chips ICs. Which is very handy. Even things like you know, we we get things like FETs, which are field effect transistors, which are look like this. They normally come in these little metal cans. You can get them in the. They I think this is a, called the TO80 case type of casing, old casing. Don't know why they still make these like this because I, I I don't really like them because they're not insulated as plastic is, but that's the way they make them. And you can also get FETs in there. Just just be careful when you're going through schematics to. Make sure you're you're not using, or you're using the right type of um, transistor, because you get junction, bipolar junction transistors and field effect transistors, and you could normally um, find out the numbers. Here's another cheat sheet which sort of gives you the pinouts on these various logic chips here. Um, Also, if you're grabbing yourself stuff, say for instance, you're getting yourself an op amp or a very kind of, um, a very sort of rare part, which you've had to order off eBay or something, get yourself, I don't know, maybe two rather than one, in case you wire one, wire one the wrong way and end up destroying it, and then you don't have nothing to fall back on. And yeah, so that's pretty much it for this. Like I said, have a look on the Simp DIY or join the Simp DIY um, Facebook group, there's also Muff Wiggler, have a, that's M-U-F-F-W-I-G-G-L-E-R, muffwiggler.com, and they have a Facebook group as well, you can find out lots and lots of uh, useful information, and also have a look at things like, um, Tom, there's a guy called Thomas Henry, who does, a, I think it's, he, it's, it's called something cookbook, something to do with uh, building musical synthesizers, or music synthesizers, etc, and you can look at lots of schematics and VCOs, and uh, there's a few others out there. So you've got the Thomas Henry. There's a few other that a few others out there. Or if you're just looking for stuff, just Google things like you know something related to what 
And I think I think to, um, something related to what you're you're looking to build. So say for instance, you want you want to have a look at a Moog VCO. You should nine times out of ten find a schematic. And the other thing I would say is probably when you're starting is kind of have a rough idea of you know what what you want to build as far as your uh, DIY synthesizer is concerned. So obviously you'll probably want you know the most basics building blocks is is the VCO. So okay, we're gonna have a voltage controlled oscillator, and I'm gonna have filter. filter and then I want to go into an amplifier, a voltage controlled amplifier also known as the VCA. So we have a voltage controlled oscillator into the filter and then we can we can tie things, we can have like say, oh I can have an, a modulator, we can have an LFO which can do multiple modulations, we can modulate pretty much everything with the LFO, very handy uh, uh, module stroke component for a synthesizer. So our LFO can pretty much modulate every single thing here. We can build multiple LFOs. So one LFO can be doing, say, uh, the VCA um, amplitude modulation genera um, duties. This one could be doing pitch modulation. And oh, so I just forgot. I forgot something here, which is our envelope generator. We could also have just a a attack release which are quite simple circuits to build an attack release envelope generator or our standard four uh, parameter ADSR so yeah so there we have it and then I suppose we can we can think about well, we, we could we could add more stuff so we could add other VCOs we may even want to have a sub a sub oscillator which we would tie to one of our master VCOs so we can track it to half the um, pitch exactly half the pitch of the master oscillator and to be honest with you that's about it I think I've covered most ground if I can think of more bits and pieces to help you guys out I will um, post them in a parts two video I hope this has uh, been useful comment and question and subscribe to the channel if you like it if you don't like it obviously give me a thumbs down and probably say why um, that was sort of constructive criticism helped me uh, improve. I'm not an electronics engineer or a, a teacher. I'm just here to share projects with you as others have shared with me. Anyway, thank you for watching people and I'll catch you all very soon.